your Bibles. Uh, I took my Bible. Here it is. Ephesians chapter 5, Genesis chapter 2, Hosea, Deuteronomy, keep going. Put your hand, put a finger in all those places there so you can just flip right over to them. Ephesians chapter 5. Um, maybe if I read Deuteronomy, or excuse me, Revelation 17, because I've been preaching a series on Mystery Babylon the Great and what she represents. And we understand um, as adults what Mystery Babylon is. She's the mother of harlots. Um, there's a proverb in the Bible. It's not in the book of Proverbs, actually. It's in the book of Ecclesiastes, or excuse me, Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel 16, uh, God is speaking of Jerusalem, his earthly city, the place of his earthly kingdom. And he describes Jerusalem as a child that he found that was born, I think, of a Hittite and a Canaanite, a mother and a father. So Jerusalem actually was in the land of Canaan. It was the city of Shalem, Salem, and means city of peace. And God said, I found you. You were cast away as a child. You were still not washed and still had the umbilical cord and everything, and you were just tossed aside. And God said, I took you and I washed you. I nursed you. I saw you grow. And then I adorned you. Uh, I am one who does not have a problem with feminine adornment. In other words, women who like to put a ring on, maybe put some earrings on, wear a pretty necklace. Um, because God, God said in Ezekiel 16 that I adorned you. I, I dressed you up. I gave you pearls to wear. I put an earring on you. I gave you rings. In other words, I, I prettied you up. You see my wife and the jewelry she wears. Uh, those are gifts that I gave her because I didn't have any money before we got married. So I didn't give her a proper engagement ring. I've been trying to redeem myself ever since. So I like to buy my wife pretty rings, pretty necklaces, pretty bracelets. Uh, I've not pierced her nose yet. She wouldn't let me. Good, yeah. But I don't, I don't have a... The, God tells you in the New Testament that that's not what you're supposed to be about. But it doesn't necessarily forbid it. Um, I think it's good when it comes from the husband. It's best when it comes from the... You don't want some other guy giving your wife's necklaces, do you? No. So anyway, God said he did all that for Jerusalem and made her beautiful. Think of the temple that Solomon built. It's a beautiful... I mean, it was eye candy. It was gold everywhere. Jewel encrusted. The, the chamber where the Ark of the Covenant was... The thing that Solomon built for that was beyond fascinating. It was amazing. And God, that's how the city of God in heaven looks like. It is beautiful. Amen? Go read Revelation. If you don't believe me, read Revelation and look at how God adorns heavenly Jerusalem. It is absolutely stunning. And he said, you took that, I espoused you. I wrote out a legal document. 
naming you as my future wife. And that was in those days, and in some judges, today's mind, legally binding. The engagement was just as binding as the marriage was. And if you ever watch Judge Judy, who watches Judge Judy? Have you ever seen Judge Judy when somebody has an engagement ring and the girl is going to break off the engagement? Judge Judy will say, give me that ring. And if you're smart, you will take the ring off and give it to the bailiff so he can give to the judge. If you're stupid, you say, well, I'm not giving you my ring. And Judge Judy will say, oh, yes, you are. So Bird, her bailiff, goes over there and says, give me the ring. Because in her mind, the ring was given by the future husband in anticipation that it would be added to in a marriage. And, he, and in her reading of the law, she says, if you cut off the engagement, you give the ring back. not bad only in my case you didn't have a ring to give back I've tried to make up for it so this sort of follows in that line it teaches us all of us how not to be Babylon not in any aspect of life Ephesians 5:22. And if you read the context of Ephesians 5, you understand that God is not taking a rod and beating up on women. You understand that. Let me give you the context of it. Open your Bible. When you see verse 21, you'll get it. Verse 21 tells us the church submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Did you know that I, the pastor am obligated to submit to each one of you members in examination of my doctrine, the things I say, my life, my morality. Yeah, I'm responsible to you in that regard that if you hear something come from me, that is of a blasphemous nature or an undoctrinal nature or unbiblical nature, it cannot be supported with Scripture, you come to me and say, Pastor, I need to talk to you. And we will reason together. I promise you we will reason together. Now, if you just come looking for a fight, you might get one. Okay, and I've had people do that. They just came looking for a fight. But if you want to reason together, I will. And I've, I've been corrected before. And will be corrected again. Likewise, you are submissive one to another. In Galatians, he says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Confessing your faults one to another. Washing the saints' feet. Those are... Evidences of submitting ourselves one to another, serving one another. So in that context, the next verse, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Not somebody else's husband, your own husband. There was a family before there was a church do you agree with that? Say amen. It is the basic institution and the foundation of civility and morality all over the world. Even the pagan nations had marriages between a what? And a... For thousands of years, they got it right. Do you know why? Because the Bible says that God wrote his law in the Gentiles' heart. In every nation in the world, murder was wrong, stealing was wrong, lying was wrong, adultery was wrong. All of those were seen as immoral acts and unlawful acts and 
and not conducive to having a civil society. Even the Japanese were smarter than that. So there has to be an order in every place. Somebody has to be the head. Somebody does. And it's not wife. Likewise, in this situation, it is not the church that is the head. Who is the head? Jesus Christ. And there's only one head. Amen? Now the head is never detached from the body or the body cannot live. Likewise, if we toss the head out, we'll never make it as a church. And I've learned that. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And so look at this. Wife... Would you submit to the Lord? If God says in his word to do something, would you do that? Wives, would you do that? Say amen. Then why won't you do it to your husband? That's an amen. If you would submit to the Lord, why would you not submit to your husband? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now I'm going to stop here for a minute. I got a lot to say, not much time to say it, so you know I'm going to carry this on. But let me say this. I understand there's a lot of divorces now, more than 20 some odd years ago when I became pastor here. It is a world of divorces. We were coming back from the restaurant uh, last night. There's a big billboard now on 55 uh, facing north, you're going southbound, you see it, uh, there's a divorce lawyer, a woman, and she's good. Now she's advertising herself with a big billboard as Jefferson County's best divorce lawyer. And what she's doing, unknowingly, is she is encouraging divorce. How so? She's giving, she's planting in the minds of men and women. I can get you out of that easily. And I can get you out of it better than anybody else can. And I can get you the most in the settlement. I can get you the most in the money. I can get you, you can keep this. You can keep the kids. You can keep the dogs. I'll make sure you get all of that. That's what she's telling people in that billboard. Now, are people going to get divorced anyway? Yes. Are there divorced people here in this church? Yes. Does that mean that you've done something wrong? Not necessarily. Not always. Even if you did, there is still time for redemption. Is there not? One of my best men here, Brother Wayne Shirk, was divorced when he married Jan. And he never really told me much except one day, looking down, he said, it was my fault. It was my fault. He's in heaven. So will Jan be. Jesus said, Behold, I make all things new. Aren't you glad for that? That you, you start over again. You make a mistake. You blew it. You can start over. And if you're blessed, you can keep the wife or the husband that you had. There can be forgiveness. But, there has to be a change. Somebody say amen. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. But that, wives, you do not have the greatest responsibility. Because 
you aren't meant to carry it. You are the weaker vessel. Now, that's not my words. You don't like those words. Tell God. He wrote them. Paul said that the wife was the weaker vessel. And it took me a while in my marriage to figure that out. It wasn't until Lisa started working here that I realized that she could not carry things that I could carry. Not just physically. There are things physically my wife cannot pick up. She cannot hold them. She cannot carry them. She cannot put them on a shelf. I'm constantly at Walmart reaching up to the top shelf for little people. Can you get this for me? Sure. Look at this. Look what I can do. See? And I dropped something the other day, at Friday, and a lady I knew, I used to work with her husband, she works at Walmart, and I said, well, you're closer to the ground, you pick it up. <laughs> I don't know if she laughed at that, but I did. But the greater responsibility here, if you look at this, is on the husband. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved this church. Let's make it this church. The church, yes, but this is the church. Does Christ love this church? What would he not do for this church. He's already given how much to this church? What has Christ given to this body of believers here? What has he given, George? And his own life. His blood. He died so that his wife could be made free. Because his wife was in, I see you, listen to this. His wife was in bondage to sin and Satan. Hosea was told, go marry a wife of whoredoms. And Hosea found Gomer, who was a harlot in town. And he's following the commandment of God, but he's not just obeying God. He finds out he loves this woman, but she's a harlot. So he marries her, and he thinks, read Hosea. This is a beautiful story. He thinks now that because he's, he's espoused her and brought her to himself, that he will change her. But then she's gone. And he has children sitting at his table. They're pretty sure not his. And he's asking them, go find your mother. So they go find Gomer. You know where she is? She's being sold as a slave. What did Gomer do? Or what did, what did Hosea do? Bought her. Bought her. He, he didn't have to pay the price, but he did. And why did he do it? One word. Love. Absolute, pure love. So does Christ love the church unconditionally. Absolutely. So what must husbands do? Absolutely, unconditionally love your wife. And I preached this years ago. And I remember what I said years ago. I said to a congregation that was different than this one here in some ways, I said, husbands, if you will not 
love your wife, then you can expect some other man to end up with half your stuff. Because a lawyer who is the best in Jefferson County, your wife will hire that lawyer and she will take you for half of everything you've got and another man will be working with your tools and lying with your wife. And you know what? I saw several couples that were sitting in this church that morning turn out that way after that. I preached it. God said it. They just didn't do it. They just didn't do it. So what's the purpose? Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. There's the Bible for you. Now we know, now it's all tied together for us, that we are cleansed in this church by a pure Bible. Not dirty water. Who grew up in a house with a bunch of kids? And did you take turns in the bath water? Who, who ever remembers taking turns in the bath water? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? If you're last, you sit in the tub. The tub has a ring and so do you, right about here. And it won't wash off. So it's got to be pure water or I wouldn't get in it. We used to swim in Joachim Creek. You can laugh if you want. We were stupid. We didn't know they were dumping nuclear waste in Joachim Creek. We were swimming in it. Our neighbor ended up with leukemia. And after he died, his son ended up with the same leukemia. And we went to Joachim Creek with them to swim. That's always stuck out in my mind, Mom. But anyway, that he might present him to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, I, I'm going to embarrass her. I should have told her to go in the nursery today. My wife walked out of the house this morning at pretty dress. I like that lace and that dress and her rings on her fingers and she's got her hair fixed and I guarantee you she spends longer in the bathroom than I do. But she don't walk out of the house without looking nice. I like it that way. I'm not vain, but I got a pretty wife. And look at this, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We ask you to bless it, bless the remainder of this message. Father, show me where to go, how far to go, what to say. I have things to say, Lord, I don't know if you want them said. So you restrain me or you provoke me either way. My mouth is yours. You're the preacher today, not me. We ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Now, look at the remainder of these verses. By, uh, Ephesians 5, 28. Now, there's another place. I don't have it in my notes, but it, it says this. Pertaining to husbands loving your wives. Husbands love your wives. And then it follows up by saying, here we go. And be not bitter against them. I've wrestled with that. And every man does, if you're honest. We wrestle because our wives do not think the way we think. And I had to learn this, sister, Helen. I had to learn this hard way. 
I thought my wife was a female version of me. But I found out she wasn't. And before it got so bad that it crossed a line, I had a talk. And I made a promise to my wife. I said, I promise you, this is biblical. I will always listen to everything you say. Now you stop and think about this. We have an analogy of Christ and the church. Does Christ listen to every prayer we pray? Does he receive every request we send to him? Do we even demand Christ do things for us that we want him to do? You ain't normal if you haven't. I did it this morning. I did it this morning in regards to Kenya. I want my way done in that nation. I'm not God. I don't know everything God knows. So maybe God's got a different plan. But did Christ listen to me? Sure he did. And then I followed it up, George, with, or God, whatever you want. Because even Christ prayed in the garden, not my will, but thine be done. So does Christ listen to every prayer, every request, every time we get angry and we call out to God? Does Christ bear that for us? Yes. So I realized years ago it was my obligation, it was my duty. But I'm just not doing it out of duty, I'm not just doing it out of commandment. I'm doing it out of, you see, you have to, if you don't do it out of love, you won't like it. And you will remain bitter. So I did, I promised her. I said, I'll listen to everything you say, no matter how you say it. And I, I said, now, here's one condition. If I agree with you, I'll probably tell you right there, yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Just, you know, I got it. It's good. If I don't agree with her, I won't say nothing. You know what I did? I quit fighting. I quit. I stopped. I, I've not been perfect. But for the most part, I quit. Out of love. And I said, I'll go think about it, and I'll pray about it. And she knew that I wasn't joking. And I said, now, if I, if I don't say anything, don't, don't keep going. Don't push. I heard you. I'm listening. I'll think about it, pray about it. I'll find out if it's right. And if, and if it's right, I'll do it. If it ain't right, then God will change her. And he has. He has. And he's changed me. Mike, you're not right. Listen to your wife. Well, I've got to read the rest of this before we get to Genesis. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. You don't hate your flesh. You don't just go around cutting hands off and cut your ear off. And you're not, you're, that's not you. And your wife is your body. That's why it is not supposed to be easy to cut off a marriage relationship. Somebody say amen. But we have people now who decide that they're going to play house. They're going to live together, shack up, 
fornicate and God hates fornication he hates adultery because he knows it destroys a civilization does it not when children grow up in an adulterous house what do those children learn become adulterers and now you have broken down the very foundation of human society it's the family so we have people that play house and they decide they're gonna to live together without the legal bond of marriage now I said these words the legal bond of marriage I believe in that I have been asked several times to perform marriages without a legal marriage license. You know what I said? I don't do that. Do you know why I said that? Let me tell you why. It's, I mean, it's actually in my notes, so I'm scooting ahead here. In the Bible, if a man wanted to divorce his wife, you know how he did it in the Bible you know how God wrote it in the law to Moses Moses this is the law this is how it's done Do you know how God said to do it does anybody know how God said do you know cubby okay you know Alicia okay does anybody else know Chris you know what did he do what did he say it wasn't just words he had to write her a bill of divorce there is no divorce in the state of Missouri without a judge signing a legal document separating the two as no longer married. Because in this country and in this state, there are legalities to a legal marriage. Did you know that in the state of Missouri, Missouri, if you are a resident of Missouri and you are attempting a common law marriage, you know what that is? Two people living together as a married couple and after 10 years in some states it is a common law marriage they are considered legally married Missouri if you are a Missouri citizen attempting that the state of Missouri no longer regards common law marriages and I agree with that so if you attempt that in the state of Missouri and that's your that's your mind that we're going to just going to be common law married. We're not going to get a marriage license. Do you know? Let me go back to what I said. Because a man loves his own body and he would not cut off his own body, it's not supposed to be easy to separate yourself from your wife or your husband. Let me tell you what this wicked generation wants. They want to play house until it gets hard, till they start fighting, throwing stuff at one another. Police are called in. You guys need to, you need, need to calm down. You need to move out, whatever. And then when they get sick of each other, they can just leave and it's done. And then he moves, the guy moves on to another girl, does the same thing. Six months later, moves on to another one, does the same thing. And let me tell you what that does to a man. Adultery. God put this in. I'm, I've got notes in here. I read things last night. You, you didn't know were in the Bible. I didn't know they were in the Bible. It causes a man to put himself in bondage. And he doesn't realize that a man that sleeps around ends up in a... In the Bible says... The, let me find this verse. Look, turn to Proverbs 5. Turn there. Boy, it's good stuff, isn't it? Listen, I, I'm not, again, I am not using my words as a rod across your back. I am trying to share with you some wisdom that God has in His Word that will help you do you believe God wants to help you say amen he's a loving God 
But he gives us a whole book full of things, wisdom things to live by. Sterling and Gloria. Lisa, how long have they been married? 60 years? 67, almost 70 years now. Do you think it was easy? Oh, I could tell you stories. But they're not here. One of them's funny. I want to tell it so bad. Anyway, it's a man, a man that sleeps around. Look at this. Proverbs 5.20. Why would thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? God knows us men, doesn't he? Hey, guys, look up here. God knows us, doesn't he? He knows us because he made us. He made us. And we respond in a certain way to certain things. So verse 21, for the ways of man and before the eyes of the Lord. So God's watching every man. And he says, and he pondereth all of his goings. And this is what he says in verse 22. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. I didn't know that was in the Bible till last night. But it's true, isn't it? A man or a woman that sleeps around on their marriage is in bondage, and he doesn't know it. God knows it. The man thinks he's living free. But he's in bondage. You know why? You know what the bondage is? He can't stop. He can't stop. Paul, uh, Peter said of the false prophets and false teachers and the false Christians in the last days, he said their eyes are full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin. You know what that means? It means, that Ron, that they have like a beast nature now. Do dogs get married? That's what a guy told me in high school one time. Because he told me, he said, I didn't get married. And I'm, I'm like, you have to. It's wrong to not be married. He said, you don't see dogs going around with wedding rings on, do you? And I said to him, are you a dog? Now, I thought I was going to get hit. We're not animals. We're not beasts. We have rules that govern and guide our passions that hold us back from doing things that we want to do that are not good in verse 23 he shall die without instruction and in the greatness of his folly shall go astray and you know what's going to happen when he dies brother he's going to he's going to lay in a casket and every and i i heard this i did a funeral for a guy when i was out at richwoods the guy was a he was a whoremongering drunk and that's all he was. And he's laying there in a the casket in his, in his short sleeve sport shirt. Never, didn't have a suit and tie. Never, never did. Never went to church. Never dressed up or anything like that. But he was a whoremonger and drunk. And everybody's going by his casket. Oh, he's at peace now. Oh, he's at rest. Oh, he's in a better place now. Lion bunch. That man died without instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. That's what God says to us, men. So let me get back to this. You, are not, you could not just say, I'm divorced. That did not have the force of law. You had to actually write out a legal bill declaring I am divorcing so-and-so for these reasons, legal reasons. She's a harlot. She's been with other men. She doesn't come home. She doesn't take care of the kids. I'm done with her. On, and sign it and post it. So this generation doesn't want that. They want the love, the love-making but they want to be able to separate when they feel like it, when they're ready to move on. And they want to be able to do it freely without any 
without having to wait to go to court, without having to get a lawyer, without having to sign in documents, how getting a judge involved, and it's going to take months, and I don't want to deal with this. So people just, the divorce rate, I think, has gone down. And it's because the marriage rate has gone down. People are not getting legally married. This oh, so we're, verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined into his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You don't want Christ to leave you, do you? Let's be honest. Who among us has ever thought about leaving Christ? And I, I like the salvation, don't get me wrong. But there's been some days that the devil pulled on me so hard. I didn't think I was going to make it. He's never left me. And I'm not going to leave him. Nevertheless, let every one of you particu in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now men, let me say something to you. Let me tell you what that means. It means you get up in the morning, shave, brush your teeth, take a shower, comb your hair, Put on some something smells nice when you go out with your wife because she wants to look up to her husband what did God do to Eve after the sin he said to your husband you shall look to a woman I figured out that my wife wants a man that she can look up to and respect. Like a lot of you ladies looked up to your daddy. Am I right? I'm right. I don't care if you say it or not, I'm right. Now Genesis 2. So here's why, guys. Your wife doesn't think the way you do. She's not supposed to. She's not supposed to. Because if you thought alike, if I thought exactly like my wife, I would be wearing the lace dress. Right? Not the vest and tie. This is a man's outfit. Amen? And you don't see me wearing flowers and pearl necklaces with earrings dressed like a sodomite. You don't see me dressed like that. There are no pictures of me wearing women's clothes. Because I don't put them on. A man is supposed to be a man. A woman is supposed to be a woman. Look around. Look around this church. Okay? JR's got a friend here. How you doing? Okay? I want you to look at JR and his friend. Look at the difference in them. He dressed like a man. Nice, nice suit. She not dressed like a man. She got flowers and leaves on her dress. He don't have that. He don't have it on his tie. It's not good that the man should be alone, is it? No. Because we're stupid. And we do stupid stuff. And the wife is going, would you get back here, you idiot? I, listen, I got mad the other day. And I was fixing to tell somebody. I had my phone in my hand. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to tell somebody off. And Lisa said, what are you doing? Nothing. 
What are you doing? I'm writing the text. To who? I'm telling somebody what I think. She said, you give me that phone. Am I making this up? Give me that phone. So I slammed it down. I drove off, and when I calmed down, I went, oh, I'm glad I didn't do that. Am I right? You idiot, get back here, sit down. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him help meet for him. So I, here's what dawned on me, Chris. It's what hit me that day. We had a talk that saved our marriage. Mike, she's not supposed to think like you. You've, Mike, you've got two eyes. And they both don't see a thing the same way, do they? Look at your finger. Put your, do, you, do this, everybody do this. Get this on camera. Of everybody in the church holding their finger out here. Like, let's do this finger, not any other finger. <laughs> now look at your finger and close your eyes like that. You'll see that, you'll see that finger switch positions, won't you? Blink, blink, blink. That is two eyes looking at the same thing from two different perspectives, but it gives you depth of knowledge, doesn't it? Gives you wisdom, doesn't it? Look, Dave is still holding his finger up. Put your finger down, Dave. I got to tell everybody. See, I to, you tell him, Renee. He won't listen to me. Hun, put your finger down. You look stupid. It's, everybody, it's on camera, okay? Hey, they make us look good, Dave. Amen. I was playing with this beard a while ago, and she said, isn't it nice and fluffy and soft? <laughs> hey, I'm going to, uh, let's, let's joke around a little bit, amen, a serious subject. But it's true. God made me realize, Mike, I didn't, I don't, she came even from a different family. And that family didn't, didn't live the way my family lived. They had different things. They came from different places. They saw, had different experiences in their life. She brings all of that into this union that we have. And the name of this sermon is United. That means the two really are one. Chris is still closing his eyes. I, see, I'm watching you guys. Everybody's going. It's funny. Y'all be up here some Sundays. <laughs> I was going to put a camera back here. And I had some people that said, we don't want to be on camera. So I, I honored that. But anyway, the idea was that she is to be there to be and help me for him and make him see things from a different perspective, a different angle. Look at it from a I could not, I'm not kidding, I could not, got up, could not find my glasses this morning. And I looked everywhere. I spent 30 minutes looking for my glasses this morning. So I, I, I gave up, David. I gave up. I said, I'm going to go get my shower. At least to get in the shower. Ten seconds, she comes. Here's your glasses. Did I make that up? Ten seconds. She finds my glasses. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here without her. Everything God's given us here. This, I wouldn't have it without her. I wouldn't have that without her. Without God raising her up at 1 o'clock in the morning and say, pray for your husband right now. And it was 9 o'clock in the morning in Kenya and I was going to get up from breakfast and go back to the hotel room and sleep during the day while the other preachers preached. And when God raised her up in the middle of the night to pray, God put it in my heart, Mike, go get in a van with the preachers and go preach to those people like I told you to. And she prayed me over there. The Lord God caused a deep sleep. See, this is Christ. Adam's Christ. Sleep in the Bible is death. Christ died so that the church could be made, could be formed, could live. 
And we are literally people taken out of his body through this. We are literally one with, united with the word of God. Somebody say amen. Oh, I'm going to turn Pentecostal on you in a little bit. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept and took one of his ribs. I like to think it was here. Because I think that's where the spear went and pierced the pericardium and the heart so that water and blood issued forth. That's the, that's the anatomy of it. And God took a rib out of Adam. A wound in his side was where his wife came from. And he made a woman and, watch this, brought her to the man. Now, in a marriage ceremony, what do we do? The man stands up here. He's already in heaven. Where is the wife? Back door. She's not here. Her daddy represents the Lord God Almighty. From his own bowels, she issued forth. And he now brings her that he has formed from his own flesh and his own life and brought her to the man. I tell you what, God brought us to Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Oh my goodness. I'm excited up here about this. And Adam said, and that's why the daddy brings that woman down and says, and I say, who giveth this? I say the King James way. Who giveth this woman to be wedded to this man? And her daddy said, her mother and I. And he let her go and gave her into my hand. I took her by the hand. We walked up on this stage and Pastor Golf gave us those vows and we swore those vows in front of a church full of people, even had it on videotape. And we signed a marriage license. So that when I fill out my taxes at the end of the year, I don't lie. Because they ask me, are you filing married or single? Does it make a difference? Show does. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. That's a marriage. That's the beauty of it. Oh, let me read this to you. Men, listen to this. Oh, listen, men, listen to this. <laughs> men let thy fountain be blessed you know what that is that's your loins that's your fountain and rejoice with the wife of thy youth we were young foolish didn't know anything didn't know what we were doing Got married, didn't even have a place to live. Didn't have no money. Got married. And you know, that's the days you live on love. Amen? And then the bills come in. You can't live on love no more. Got to go to work. Amen? Listen to, the, listen to how God is so beautiful. God, you're so beautiful. This is how it was yesterday. I was a mess. Let her be as the loving hind in pleasant row. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. And be thou ravished always with her love. Not some sleazy whore 
that you hooked up with on the internet. But your wife that you married years ago. May you always be satisfied with her love. Amen? Then we already read this verse. And wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman? Now is the warning. You see, the, you see the, the conflict here. On one side, he's encouraging us men, be blessed, let thy fountain be blessed. In other words, bless your children, bless their children. I am enjoying right now the time of my life with all of my grandchildren. I'm, I am eating it up. Sitting here chilling with Cheeseburger a while ago. He called me the other night at the ball game. Said he was scared and I helped, helped him out a little bit. That was him, wasn't it? So he, he's encouraging us here to stick with our wives. Now he's warning us. Wilt thou son be ravished with a strange one? Embrace the bosom of a stranger. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. And he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquity shall... Take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. And I'd be wrong if I told you the devil didn't try that one. And I guarantee you he's tried it, every man in this room. And he'll try it again, he'll try it again, he'll try it again, he'll try it again. It says, number one, adultery and fornication is the devil's number one favorite tool to use to destroy a church, a family, a civilization, destroy a whole country. And our country is almost gone because of lack of marriage in this country. Lack of marriage. Adultery is a sin thou shalt not commit Adultery. In the church, you know what my responsibility is in the church? Does anybody know what my job is? My job is if I find out that somebody is committing fornication, my job is to go to them privately with the anticipation and a hope that they can be restored to godliness. If they will not repent, you know what my obligation is then? Take John or one of you other fellows and go to that person with a second witness with the anticipation and hope that you will repent. And live a godly life. My responsibility after that is if you will not repent. Then I must gather the church together. And let the men of this church select godly men in this church to serve as judges. While I as a prosecutor bring forth a case of fornication against a church member. And that church member has a right to defend themselves to the congregation and to those judges. But if the church believes that that person is living in fornication, the church must put them out. And you know what Christ said after that? Whatsoever you bind in earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose in earth shall be loosed in heaven. You know what that means? You know what I think that means? I think that means that if you drag this church into your fornication life and make this church vote on you, God's going to honor it. You don't want that. I don't want to do it. Don't. Make me do it. Don't make me do it to you. Don't make me do it to my family members. 
and I won't make you do it to me. Somebody say amen. Because if I'm the one in fornication, in adultery, you have the same obligation. Come to me privately. Bring a second witness. If I will not repent, you drag me before this church. And if I'm guilty, you toss me out. That's the word of God. I'm not the head of this church. The word of God is. And things must be done the way the word of God says. Let's bow our heads. Father, we got a lot, we got a lot to pray about. We got a lot of things, Lord, to think about. Things we didn't know. Things we knew that we just ignored or things we knew and we forgot. And it's good to be reminded of them. Because which one of us, which one of us, Father, is not guilty among us? Which one of us, Father, is worthy to cast a stone? Which one of us, Father, is even worthy to judge another? Let it be a sad day that we ever have to have a church meeting. Let it be a sad day. Father, I pray to your God that you'd bless ladies here without a husband. Lord, somebody asked me the other day, you were there. And they said, what about us who don't have a husband? I said, God then will be your husband. Let God be your head. Let God watch over you. Let God be your protection. Let God help you raise your children. Because God, you know we live in a generation of whoremongering men. Men even, Father, that are turning out to be sodomites. Even among us. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would cause people, Lord, to repent like Israel repented of old. And God, that you would bring restoration like you restored Israel of old. And God, that your Holy Spirit would live in their lives and give them wisdom and teach them, Father, how to break the cords of their own sins so, and give them instruction in righteousness and how to live. And how, to, how to have a wife and how to keep a wife and how to, how to have a happy wife and a happy family. And a man, Father, that could be worthy of your word and rule his family well. Which doesn't mean that he's a dictator over them. He does a good job. He does it well. Father, help us men to be satisfied with our wives. Help our wives, dear God, to be proud and reverence. Be willing to reverence and, be, and have joy in reverencing their husband because of the work that you've done in their lives. Help us men, Father, to be worthy of the respect and reverence that our wives give us. Help our ladies, dear God, to be worthy of the love that their husbands must give them. And God, forgive us all for not living under these precious guidelines, your wisdom. Father, bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. Stand to your feet this morning. I appreciate you coming. Appreciate you bearing with me. Roy's out there waiting on you. He wants to shake your hand. He wants you to give him five bucks for watching over you. Amen, Roy. Amen. Father, dismiss us now in your care. Bless your word, Father, that's given out today. Lord, use it, Father, not as a rod 
unless a child needs it. And Father, all of us act childish, and we need a rod every now and then. But Father, Lord, use these words as comfort and guidance and wisdom, things that will help us have a happy life and a happy home and a happy church. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.